For thousands of years, this was the natural sound of America's West, breezes blowing and animals migrating, finding food and traversing hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles. Today, those sounds are still around, but they can be drowned out. Roads and highways in particular are a major obstacle to terrestrial wildlife migration. It turns out that what we humans have built to efficiently get from point A to point B has the opposite effect on wildlife. Busy highways, increasingly common in the West, they either stop animals altogether from being able to cross the road or highway, stranding them in a small patch of habitat that they don't want to be in, or animals try to cross the road and essentially roll the dice with motorists zooming by at 70 miles an hour. And you can imagine how that story doesn't end well for the animal or the driver. For the Pew Charitable Trusts, I'm Dan LaDuc, and thanks for joining us for this fifth episode of our States of Innovation season here at After the Fact. You have just heard from Matt Scraw, who leads Pew's efforts to develop wildlife corridors in America's West. Actually, those corridors have always been there. Animals have always naturally followed them. Today, the work is finding ways to keep the animals moving on routes that are bisected by roads and highways. That matters because it saves lives and dollars, which takes us to our data point for this episode. Eight billion dollars. That's the cost from one million wildlife collisions that occur each year in this country. Here's Matt Scraw again to tell us more about the solutions some states are beginning to use to prevent these collisions. Our story really uh, about conserving the, the West's far-ranging emblematic wildlife really starts with the advent of a small little computer chip and a GPS transponder that researchers just recently began attaching to animals to see where they go and when. And so this new technology, in addition to teaching us about these herds, is also allowing us to do things about helping those herds move, right? So talk a little bit about what, you're, what we're learning uh, in that context. Well, first, let me, let me tell you a little bit about what a wildlife corridor or a migration corridor is. Uh, it, it really is a, a linear strip of land you know, of varying width that a group of animals uses to get from point A to point B over the course of a year. Uh, migration corridors in particular are, are used seasonally. They're used once in the spring and then again, again in the fall as a herd of animals moves from their winter habitat at lower elevations to their summer habitat, usually at higher elevations. And these wildlife corridors, they might be several miles wide or maybe several hundred, uh, several hundred yards wide, uh, depending on the terrain and other landscape features. And here in the American West, uh, we're discovering that these corridors can be hundreds of miles long in some cases, spanning mountains and valleys and crossing numerous highways and fences. So these GPS collars that are often safely affixed around the neck of, of, of animals have really begun to answer questions about how and where animals move across landscapes in, in stunning detail, telling us fascinating stories about ancient pathways or, or migration corridors that have been passed down from generation to generation in order for these animals to survive what, what nature deals out every year. And the GPS collar essentially talks to a satellite in space every hour, every two hours. So if you multiply that data stream that's collecting data on movement and location of animals by say 40 or 50 or 100 animals that have collars on them, you start to amass a very large data set that gives you a very fine scale inference into how these animals are utilizing landscapes in a spatial and a temporal sense. Jody Hilty is president and chief scientist of the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative and one of the first to write a book on the subject of corridor ecology or wildlife corridors. We spoke to her about this incredible movement of animals across the Western landscape. To get us started, we should talk about what the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative is. Yes, uh, well, it was one of the very first large landscape conservation visions. We envision connecting and protecting the habitat from all the way down in Wyoming, from Yellowstone National Park, all the way to the Arctic Circle in the Yukon. And why would we pick this region? 
because this place is the place that still has all of the large carnivores like grizzly bears and wolves and mountain lions and wolverines. And it also still has all of the hooved animals, dolls, sheep, caribou, moose, elk, and so many more. It's the last best place to get this done and arguably the most intact mountain ecosystem in North America. Our job is to keep it that way. Well, tell us about these animals. What do these migrations look like? In the early 1990s, in the, the Rocky Mountains that span Canada and the United States, there was this wolf named Pluey. And they put a collar on her just south of Banff National Park. And she took a 100,000 square kilometer jaunt. She went across two countries, three states, two provinces, and overall 30 different jurisdictions. And I think she and other animals during the sort of early days of GPS collars really taught us a lot that animals moved a lot further than we ever knew. Today, we're really seeing these incredible movements and they show us that parks are really important. Pluey went through several parks, but they're not necessarily adequate for animals that need to ro roam at that scale. And we see this with, with animal migrations. For example, two of the longest migrations of uh, hooved animals are pronghorn and deer, and uh, mule deer in Wyoming. These animals are moving hundreds of miles and they're migrating and they're sort of following that snow line. And as the, the uh, grass and herbs just start to green out, they're the richest, the, the best for, for these uh, animals. And so they follow it up and it's worth migrating to get that extra nutrients. Um, and then of course in the winter, they come back down. As researchers learn more about how animals like Pluey move across the land, they have been able to create more innovative solutions that protect people and wildlife. Back to Matt Scroff for more on this. We're finally well equipped now to confidently install uh, transportation infrastructure like bridges and underpasses in these collision hotspots for animals to use. Uh, sometimes we can simply convert an existing culvert under a road whereas other projects build pretty significant bridges designed specifically for wildlife to, to cross the, uh, the highway or the road. And either way, our goal is to first get the animal off the roadway and second, to allow the animal to continue on their migration. So when they're done right, which is almost always the case now because of this, this better inference that, that we have through technology and science, we regularly see wildlife vehicle collisions decrease by 80 or 90 percent where interventions are, are deployed. And, and what I mean is where we build structures or, um, or fencing that guide animals to safe crossing areas and they use that, keeping them off the roadway. How do we know where to, where to put these structures or, or culverts? And then how do we actually funnel the animal into them and get them to use them? Yeah, there's, there's two primary ways in which we can, with, with some precision, pinpoint these, these spots where we need to intervene. First, back to those GPS collars, right? So those GPS collars, when they're affixed to animals, they give us sub-meter resolution. I mean, we know exactly where they are every hour, maybe two hours, maybe three hours. And so over time, among multiple animals, we have very good resolution of where they're crossing roads or highways. Secondly, and unfortunately, we know where people are hitting animals because we have carcasses on the side of the road, we have cleanup crews, we have ambulance going out to help people. Between those two things, we've got a really good sense of where the problem exists. And with that, we can then go in and say, okay, what makes the most sense from a design perspective here to solve the problem? These culverts, underpasses, and overpasses are key in curbing animal collisions. Jody Hilty explains how they work. If they're really busy roads, like Interstate 90, um, they might not be passable for some wildlife. So for example, with grizzly bears, one research study said that 100 cars per hour means that it's impassable for grizzly bears. 
So if we want grizzly bears to connect on either side of a road that has more than 100 cars in an hour, then we need to work with the Department of Transportation to ensure that wildlife can either go over the highway safely with overpasses or underneath the road with underpasses. There are some not far from where I'm sitting right now outside of Banff. So in Banff National Park, they have over 40 wildlife crossing structures. It's the most well-studied crossing system in the world and informs what's happening in the rest of the world. We know lots of individual animals are using those overpasses. Some of them have breakfast on one side and lunch on the other. Some of them just use it once to migrate to go find a mate. Um, there's all sorts of different uses of those. And we're finding that females and males actually use different structures. And what's different about them from a standard bridge is there's actually trees on them. So what they look like if you were standing on top of them is they have a berm of dirt on either side on the edges and, that allow the wildlife to go through the middle. And it's a little quieter and more secluded for those animals who might be sensitive to humans and to cars. We're creating a version of nature over a highway, right? We're, you know, a, a, a dirt covered bridge that has got trees and things on it. But do, do they need steering to sort of nudge them along in there? Or do they naturally take to it? Do we have to have fences that lead them there? How do you stop the young buck who just says, hey, I'm sprinting across the road, mom, and he takes off, you know? Yeah, it, what we found is that fencing for, for overpasses and underpasses is really important because it actually directs the wildlife to the overpasses and keeps them safely off the road. So for, for hooved animals, it keeps about 90% of them, uh, or it, it decreases the, about 90% of the collisions that would happen between these hooved animals like elk and moose and cars. So it's keeping people safe and wildlife safe. This doesn't just protect wildlife and humans, it also saves states real money, putting a big dent in that $8 billion the nation spends on collisions each year. Here's Matt again. So in addition to the ecological benefits of providing safe passage for, for wildlife and, and therefore making for healthy, healthier populations and herds, there's also a real economic benefit to humans and a real safety and benefit to humans as well. We know now that the average cost of hitting a mule deer, say, costs a driver somewhere around $8,200. And an elk, which is a larger, heavier animal, usually averages up to $25,000 in, in costs associated with, with a collision with, with an elk. And a moose, which is even larger, can top 1,000 pounds or more, the damage can be pretty severe uh, and obviously injuries and sometimes human deaths as a result of those collisions. And we often spend around $45,000 per collision with, with moose. And so in places where we see in a very short space, a hundred or more of these collisions in a year, that really adds up. And when we implement solutions that reduce those wildlife vehicle collisions, reduce the threat of injury or death, and improve safe passage for wildlife, the fact is, is that these projects can pay for themselves over a relatively short amount of time. Can you go through a couple of, of real place examples for us that have been successful? Wyoming has been a real leader given the, the rich assemblage of, of large wildlife that, that roam that state. But I can think of almost every Western state and, and give you an example of what they have done uh, in the recent past to address this issue. I can look at a project such as Colorado State Highway 9, which has a, a series of, of interventions that include two overpasses and multiple underpasses with associated fencing. And we've seen a decrease of 90% of in wildlife vehicle collisions there. In Western Washington state, there is a billion dollar project that is uh, on its second or third phase now uh, 
where they have, over the course of many miles, installed a number of different crossing structures for multiple different kinds of species, not only limited to big game species like, like elk or, or mule deer, but also thinking about fish passage and thinking about reptiles and amphibians you know, that are also hampered uh, by, by our transportation infrastructure development. And so it can really run the gamut. We're concentrating on the West because obviously these massive herds, uh, that's, that's where this happens. But w what you're describing seems like it could translate to just about anywhere in the United States where animals need to cross and, and we can figure out appropriate paths for them. That's right. So in the Eastern US, um, the same issue applies in a slightly different context. And it, it really can depend on what species we're talking about too. There has been some really innovative work that has gone into creating crossing structures for turtles, for salamanders, even for crabs in certain places. Uh, and they all look very different. And so um, there's, uh, with some ingenuity, with some creativity, the solution is there. And certainly with those smaller animals, you don't have the, the economic consideration relative to human injury or, or actual collisions but uh, there is a real econo uh, ecological benefit in installing some of these structures for species that might be imperiled, you know, threatened or endangered. So there is a strong policy opportunity right now because of that new science that has given us so much more information about how to do this right. We just want to make sure that we're connecting that science with the policy and making sure that that science is doing its best to inform a good approach. Thanks for joining us. You can learn more about wildlife corridors at pewtrust.org slash after the fact. Please tune in next week for the last episode in our States of Innovation season. And we'd like to know the stories you want to hear. Go to pew.org slash ATF survey to take our listener survey. If you complete it before February 1st, you can enter to win a $50 Visa gift card. And you can see the full official rules at the survey link. Until next time, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact from the Pew Charitable Trusts.